Good day, everyone. Welcome back to True Footy. Today, I'm going to do something a little bit out of my usual routine and do a bit of a Q&A as a bit of a celebration, I suppose, for hitting 30,000 subscribers, which happened about a week or two ago. My big audacious goal was to hit it by grand final day, and uh, you guys helped me get there really early. So once again, I thank you so much. And, uh, you know, the, the whole question and answer kind of celebration of milestones is something that I've done in the past and then other times I look back and I'm going geez that's that's a really cringy idea like is it super vain um maybe I don't know I, I've kind of withdrawn from the idea and then, and then come back around to it I think personally I watch someone called Chris Williamson who does the modern wisdom podcast and he does Q&A's every time he hits a milestone and I find that those tend to be some of my favorite episodes and why not I mean we're in the busy part of the year but um, you know one thing I've worked really hard to do this year or at least improve on is build my connection with the audience and the regular viewers and all the people who support this channel so I suppose this is another way of doing that so uh, a couple of weeks ago I put up a post asking uh, for questions for a QA and a and you guys have delivered so we're going to move through them and um, yeah, there's a, there's a variety of questions here. I said it could be about football or otherwise. So there's some personal questions, there's some footy questions, and we're just gonna roll through them in no particular order. But uh, first of all, I just wanna offer a big sincere thank you to everyone who supports the channel. And that includes anyone who's, you know, watched and liked the video or, you know, um, felt the need to hit subscribe, which I really appreciate as well. Um, all the way through to people who watch just about every video, comment in every video. There are people who have financially supported the channel through other memberships or um, you know the, the occasional donation and, and live streams. And I, I really appreciate you all. It makes me feel like I kind of don't really deserve it. There's this weird feeling of being uncomfortable with it while simultaneously being very grateful to you all. So yeah, I, I think, I suppose there's some kind of nice full circle-ness to this Q and A. The last time I did this was when I hit twenty thousand, and that was right before I moved to the UK. So here we are, the best part of eighteen months later, doing a thirty thousand subscriber podcast, and I'm about ten weeks away from moving back to Western Australia. Um, I've been living in uh, England in a place called Macclesfield, which is near Manchester. Uh, for the last year and a half, and you know something that's kind of wild to me as well is that. In that time, this entire time of um, working full time as an AFL YouTuber, the channel's grown by like nearly thirty percent or whatever. It's just so funny to me that to think there's so many people that have come along for the ride in the last year or two that have never known True Footy when he wasn't in England, um, which is kind of strange. I've been doing this for about seven years now. It's been a long, long uh, journey, and um, particularly the last sixteen to eighteen months have been big for the channel. I, I really started trying really hard uh, about 12 months ago this time last year is when i kind of made the decision that once my travels were over here in the uk um, that was my first you know primary thing was to come over here and travel and do youtube around that to try and support myself financially a little bit whilst accepting i was never going to make enough money to completely mitigate it um, but come the end of the season september october november last year um, the channel started doing better than it ever had before and i was faced with a very real um, decision of, of what do I do here? Do I continue doing YouTube full time? Because at the moment or at that point in time, I was making enough to live off and I was living poor and I have been since real poor, like just paycheck to paycheck, making ends meet. Um, or I could try and get a job here in England and kind of do what I really intended to do when I came over here. And that's to, you know, build a, you know, a friendship group and potentially help my resume and, and build a little bit of a career doing whatever i think marketing law is my background but i reckon i made that decision about last november to to go full steam ahead on the channel and make sacrifices those sacrifices being <laughs> largely financial um and you know it's it's led to a pretty insular lifestyle but i'm really enjoying it so we've got a few questions around that i guess we'll get into those so the first question we have is from mick schwager who says we love your videos mate thank you you're a very smart young guy. I appreciate you saying young because I'm on the other side of 30 now and I don't know in what context I qualify as young. I suppose to people my dad's age, I'm a young guy. Um, and you know, to, to people I meet in their early 20s now, I'm old as fuck in their words. Uh, but the question is, why don't you follow the Dockers? And Danny Dark also says, out of all the AFL teams, what made you decide with West Coast? So I'd love to have a really good answer for this other than to say it is an inherited team because my family chose to go for West Coast. You know, in some parallel universe, I'd be a Carlton fan because my dad 
was a big waffle um, fan growing up. Like he was, his West Coast was the Perth Demons. And uh, he was old enough to attend the three-peat in 66, 67, 68, I reckon. Um, big rivalry with East Perth. And his favorite player was Peter Bizzusto, who then joined Carlton. And dad went for Carlton in the VFL until the Eagles came in. So real sliding doors moment. I have, uh, well, two premierships that I'm old enough to remember as a West Coast fan. And um, yeah, I was probably too young in 1995 to have really perceived a Carlton premiership. So thank God for that. As for Fremantle, um, yeah, I'm not too sure. I think when Fremantle came into the competition, my dad and I, by extension, were living in Thailand. So, um, you know, what I've found as I've gotten older is a lot of people who grew up around that sort of Fremantle area in Western Australia, um, and I just mean like the adjacent suburbs and a lot of the southern suburbs tend to be Fremantle fans. And my dad was from like that Lathlane kind of area. So again, boring answer as to why I don't go for Fremantle. But it, it was inherited, and thank God, thank God. Sorry, no disrespect. As an aside, I'm really loving, as West Coast have become such a farty little team over the last few years, I am really enjoying being the chirpy West Coast fan that goes for the team that's in the bottom three. Um, it is a new kind of fun. Like, there's only so much you can say when your team is ratchet, and, um, you know, by contrast, Fremantle have gone well. But I've really enjoyed that rivalry of just being a smart ass. I think it, I think it comes from this, like, inherited McClure instinct to, to think that everything I say is funny. So I chirp up quite a lot, but I try and keep a lot of it off camera. Um, it's all good stuff. We got a question here from Shadow Light. He says, congrats on reaching your goal mates, credit to your work in providing fun, interesting content. Thank you so much. Uh, and some questions, what sort of off season content can we look forward to seeing on the channel? We'll start with that. So um, the elephant in the room is I'm moving back to Perth um, in December, like probably the first week of December. So this time last year or that time last year, I delved into this club by club series of um, analyzing each team ahead of the 2024 season, going through the best 22 and, and what I thought of their various lists. And um, I thought that was so fruitful. Like the, the views weren't necessarily amazing at first. They tend to, they, t- they actually got a bit more attention as the season started. Um, but the, the feedback was good on them. And I think the biggest primary thing I got out of it was it prepared me so well for the 2024 season. And, you know, obviously never going to get all my predictions right. But I felt like this year without going, without checking it, I will check that in another video coming up. I felt like my predictions were probably more accurate than they've ever been before. Could be complete coincidence. Uh, But either way, I felt like it it really gave me a good foundation going into this year. So in an ideal world, I would do that series again. And, um, but I do have to acknowledge the fact that I'm going to be moving back to Perth and I'm going to be moving in with my sister who has a brand new baby, a nephew that I haven't met yet. And my routine is going to have to change and um, I'm going to have to figure out what the hell I'm doing next. So I can't promise it's going to be, I think I uploaded 70 videos last December. I don't know if I can commit to that again, but I will do my best. I don't even know if like the place that I'm moving into is going to have a room for me to record videos. There's also going to be a screaming child in that house, but I'll do my best. I did it in America with two young nieces and nephews and um, I'm I'm absolutely going to do my best. But, um, you know, as for as for specific ideas for content outside of that, it's really hard to speculate at the moment and and that's not because I don't want to deliver and and make good content I really do I think about it every day like what's what's December and January going to look like for me Um, but I just have no certainty at the moment and that's that's what happens when you move countries for the second time in two years what changes to the AFL fixture would you make if you were in charge Ooh, this is a tough one Um, I am really against shortening the season and I realize that lengthening the season has its pitfalls as well because, um, well, the the player load sort of situation there. So I think in an ideal world with bigger playing lists and a deeper talent pool, we'd have bigger rosters for teams and be able to play more games to try and mitigate um, the inequities in our league. Um, You know, the fact that arbitrarily some teams have an easier fixture than others is something that kind of more or less only exists in our sport. It's, It's bizarre. To make it perfectly fair, you need to extend it to two games per team a year. So that's a 34 team season, uh, 34 game season, but that will change. If we go to a 20 team competition, that becomes 38. So much like the Premier League. So to extend from 23 games currently now to 38, I don't think that's ever going to happen. So um, I think in terms of fairness, you'd probably have to go to some sort of conference system and I'm against that as well. So 
to answer your question, the shortest, well, the, the most short-term realistic thing I would do is really just look at travel. And I'm as a West Coast fan, I realize I have a particular horse in that race, but you know, certain things like West Coast going to Tasmania and um, Gold Coast in the same season, and um, comparatively, a lot of teams don't have to travel like that. So I think there's certain concessions we can make there in terms of that. It's, it's a bit bizarre. So I'd probably start with that travel burden um, and, and go from there. Shadow Light asks, you're lining up for a set shot at goal after the final siren in the fourth quarter. The kick can win your club the game as you stand directly in front 35 meters out. How are you approaching the kick? A drop punt, a barrel, or a check side like Harry Mackay? Uh, certainly not a check side. I think directly in front, you've got to go drop punt. I think... If you shank, shank a drop punt, the scrutiny on you would be far less than if you tried a check side and belly down on the full. Now, if I'm in the Dom Sheed pocket, you know, I, Dom Sheed said the same thing after that kick. He said he, his biggest fear was trying to snap it and kicking it out on the full. It would be far more embarrassing, and I would have the same instincts. My skill set is pretty limited. I'm much more a drop punt kind of guy than a check side or a snap or whatever. Um, so I think drop punt is my answer to all of it, but intri- intriguing question. PS24 says, so happy for you, Jesse. Some questions. Thank you. Who do you think will win the Brownlow? Um, I'm going to release a video on that soon, but I think I'm going to say Dacos ahead of Neil and Cripps in that order. Dacos first. Are you 100% sure the Eagles will get a good trade? If so, who? Um, no, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think the, the ones we're linked to is Liam Baker, Jack Graham, and then it trades out for Barris and Darling. So I think where does my excitement go with all of that? I'm probably intrigued to see how we can improve our draft position. So hopefully, I'm, I'm fairly confident we get a good deal for Tom Barris. So um, from that point of view, yes, but I don't think Liam Baker is a 50-50 at this point to join West Coast, and he would be a pretty good recruit. Uh, but outside of that, I think it's going to be somewhat low-key. And who is your second favorite footy team? Uh, I've kind of removed this notion from my brain. Um, I, I try to be really impartial since I started True Footy. I try. Um, so I think this one can be fluid. I think in the, in the past, you know, I probably adopted Gold Coast. I think back in the day it was Richmond and then they got good and then I got over that very quickly. I think I used to like Carlton before they got good around that 2011 phase as well. Um, so who is it now? Uh, I really don't have one. I do find myself liking Sydney. I still like the Bulldogs, um, but I think I'm just too deeply loyal to West Coast to really give a shit about any other team, um, to be honest. And I've, uh, if you reframe it as like, if West Coast got booted from the comp, who would I support? I do think that, you know, as outside of this being my career at the moment, I don't think I would have another team. I really don't think I would. So yeah, there you go. Bo Blutz or Bob Bob Lutz. Bo Blutz. I'm sorry if your name is Bob Lutz or Bob Lutz. And I just read it as Bob Lutz. It's funny anyway. G'day, how go the travels? What are your predictions for Richmond for the next two to three years? Thank you for your hard work and all the excellent content. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that nice comment. Uh, As for the travels, um, so other than living in the UK, I haven't really been traveling lately. Um, I did a whole stack of that last year and a little bit at the start of this year. um, And that was all fun. By the end of it, I was pretty keen to um, enjoy some routine and normality a little bit. And um, (laughs) at the risk of going too deep on it, on a fairly simple question, I think one thing I found that throughout all my travels throughout like last year and this year is while I was so good and so many good memories, there was a sense at the end of it. It was like, wow, I'm, I'm kind of going back home with nothing but memories now, which is at the end of the day, that's all we're going to really die with, right? Our memories. And then it all goes black. So maybe not even that, but you know, on, on your deathbed, those memories are still important. Um, but I, well, I guess what I'm saying is there was a sense of like craving some sort of permanence in my life. And I just, for as good as this trip's been to the UK and, and all that travel, you know, I don't really have any friends in Macclesfield, which I'll expand on later with a question other than my mate Will. And I had such good friendships and connections made with people. And then you say goodbye. And then it's like, oh, I might see you again once. Um, you know, even like, you know, if you meet a great girl, which I did earlier this year, a sense of like, oh, this was great for a short while. And then it has to end. And you're just like, I, I guess for me, I felt a desire for be like, okay, I'm looking for something a little bit more um, long lasting and something that I can have. You know what I mean? Not just reflect on really deep answer to a very simple question. What are your predictions for Richmond is the follow up. Um, 
I will hold fire before going too hard on this opinion until the trade period and, and the draft. But I do think this decision to blow up their best 22 and attack the draft will mean the next two, three years are tough. And it will take an outstanding coach to mitigate that. I think the best 22, if you take out all the players that are linked to leaving, and they might keep a couple of them. So like Jack Graham, maybe Liam Baker could stay. Pretty unlikely at this point. Um, Shea Bolton and Rioli could stay. Maybe not. If you lose all of them, I think you're looking at a wooden spoon next year. And then maybe even the next year after that. Um, past that, it's a little bit harder to forecast. I understand why that they're, they're doing this to get ahead of the Tasmania thing. But I do wonder how bad it's going to get before it gets better. That's my honest opinion at this point in time. Papley lives rent-free in your head, says, congrats, mate, well-deserved. Serious question, though, do you mow the lawn? Um, so I live in an apartment and uh, have done for the last 18 months, and the, t- the place I lived in before that was also an apartment. The last time I mowed the lawn was 2018. Now, I realize you're probably talking about pubes, but I'm going to answer you literally to keep it PG. Mason Barker says, does Jesse have a girlfriend? If so, why isn't it me? Also, congrats on 30K. My favorite AFL YouTuber. Thank you, Mason. I appreciate it. No, no girlfriend. Like I said, um, it, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. This whole thing has been a temporary thing. So even things like dating have been largely pointless. I last went on a date in November of last year. It's just, yeah, that, that's the part I'm sort of looking to get past. I kind of want to get on with my life. I want to get married. Um, so living in limbo like I currently am, I'm looking forward to getting to a place in my life where I'm building something and it's something that I can keep, like an asset. As, as, um, as unfeeling as that phrase sounds, it's true. Something that I can keep. Whereas, you know, going to, on dates and meeting a girl here, it almost feels pointless at this point. Um, for a guy who's on the other side of 30, um, I'm, lo- I'm looking for something. So if any of you are hot chicks, please let me know. <laughs> Brizzy Brog says, congrats on 30K. Thank you, mate. Question one, who is the best coach in the AFL and for what reason? Well, I think that uh, the m- main ones that come to mind are Longmire, Chris Scott. I think you have to consider Sam Mitchell in here um, and Chris Fagan as well. I think one thing that may get lost around Fagan is, and even Hinkley to some extent, but mostly Fagan, is considering where they were when they took over and the amazing facelift they've given those teams and long-lasting competitive cultures. I think that worked really well in Fagan's favor, even if you know they fell four points short of a premiership. I don't think that devalues his uh, impact. That being said, there's also Sam Mitchell, who may, may, he may be the best coach in the AFL, but he doesn't have the resume. So it feels a little bit wrong to compare him to some of these team, uh, these coaches that have done it year after year consistently. Longmire and Chris Scott are two of the best examples of that. They put their team in contention for flags and finals like consistently. No one better than Chris Scott at that and defying the odds of what a list build should look like. Define logic, really. I think it's probably Chris Scott with the caveat against Sydney of... Sydney's probably benefited from their academy and uh, I don't want to make a huge point of that because I still think you have to be an amazing football club to be as good as they are. But, you know, you take out Goulden, Heaney, Callum Mills and Nick Blakey from that team um, and, you know, he wouldn't be, well, they wouldn't be as blessed. Whereas Geelong, I think, have really done it the hard way and they've recruited some stars and there's a little bit of help in that. Maybe not help, but could we just say luck a little bit? Um, it's an earned advantage that they have that they can... Uh, attract these players and a little bit of a geographical one as well but it's still you know coming from a guy who supports a team that did you know go hard for a big trade target it doesn't always work out and Geelong have routinely routinely built systems around these players and optimize their talents so I think long-winded way of saying I think Chris Scott at the moment what club is best placed for a good offseason and start to 2025? Um, that's a hard one to, to answer. For good offseason, I mean, there's quite a few, and that, that is subjective. Like, would Richmond say their offseason is good if they land all these draft picks? Probably, but then 2025 probably won't go so well, in my opinion. Um, you're a Gold Coast Suns fan, I can see that. I would say that they'd be a contender because while there's not a lot, a lot of noise made about it, if you add Dusty Martin, Daniel Rioli, John Noble and a top 10 pick in this offseason, then that's going to stack up really well, even if Dusty's at the end of his career. I still think that's a pretty fantastic offseason, to be honest. Uh, Hawthorne are a contender here, so a Fremantle. 
Um, we'll see what happens. But in terms of like big, if you're focusing on the trade period in particular, those are the big contenders, I would say. There's still so much to play out. I'm not too sure. Nostalgic Vibes asks, what do you think the Cats will have to trade to land Bailey Smith? Do you think the Cats have what it takes to win the granny this year? So um, I presume this was probably asked after they beat Port Adelaide and I'm recording it before they play Brisbane for clarity. So no games since. Um, uh, yeah, I think Geelong are probably my pick right now for the grand final. Um, they've got to get there first, but two MCG games in a row, I think they start favourites. What do they have to trade to land Bailey Smith? Uh, their first pick is either 16 or 18, depending on how the finals finish up. Um, that's a starting point. It might cost them two firsts, to be honest, considering their second first is likely to also be in the same range. So similar to the Tom Barris deal, you know, could they offer two late teens picks? The thing that works against that, Bailey Smith sort of declined a little bit as a player, not played in the right position. Then he did his ACL out of contract. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's two firsts and something going back to Geelong. But, you know, I think it's fair to suggest he's worth as much as Tom Barris. Bear in mind, Tom Barris is, is contracted, so that makes it a little bit different. Wooden Spoon Data says, well done. Thank you. What do you think would be the biggest lesson you've learned taking this on full time? Um, I think probably, because I've been doing it for a while now, these lessons probably came early and um, I've been more putting them into practice since. But I found the first thing I found was diff it was difficult when you're financially reliant on this, where you need to make so much content to make your life work that you had to spend less time on each video. And that gets easier over time because the more you immerse yourself in the comp, which I have done for 12 months, uh, like more so than ever, then there are fruits to that where you can generally speak about AFL more easily off the cuff. Um, that being said, you know, putting more time into individual projects um, was difficult. You know, I used to spend a little bit more time per video. Um, now, now I'm more like, trying to be time sensitive and you know some some topics are time sensitive i can't take an extra day to do a trade update for instance because things change um but i have managed to do a few longer higher effort videos but i found ways to make filler videos in the time that it takes to make the long video in the background so for instance like the way geelong became a powerhouse that's a video that's doing really well in the background that i made at the start of the year so there's that um, and the other lesson I found is just the reward for really investing in your audience and building connection and relationship there. For a number of years, I reckon between well, 2020 to pretty much the first few months that I lived here even. So a good stretch there. I kind of just withdrew from replying to comments. I always read them. I always wanted a good feel for what people said and thought, but I didn't really respond or make any effort and that wasn't certainly wasn't a place of arrogance thinking i was too good for it or anything that was it was literally a self-protection thing and i find that being a very introverted person i find it really it is something difficult for me to invest in in that so for instance my instagram is absolutely dead i just can't do it i just cannot put myself out there and you know have to respond to people and withdraw uh, like i just withdraw naturally and i i realize that's a weakness that's holding me back but i have a limit to what i do so what i do now is i involve people with videos a lot i do that on purpose you know to um you know build a connection with people but also it makes my life easier a little bit when people are you know supplying a lot of comments and commentary to the football come down for instance or afl unpopular opinions um there's so many benefits to that live streams doing those a little bit more regularly over the last 12 months has been awesome i've really enjoyed those they are not at all profitable um you know i'm probably make eight dollars for a three hour live stream uh, but it's good fun and they always devolve into some sort of star wars chat but also like again without sounding too deep or cringe about this but like the truth is because i only really think about work other than when i go to the gym um, I only do that. That's the sacrifice that I've made to try and make this work. Um, my social life has fallen away. Um, I'm okay, by the way. That's <laughs> not to make it sound like I'm lonely. I, I'm, I actually don't really care about that. But I guess what I'm saying is like, I feel like a sense of kinship with a lot of people who comment regularly, particularly the, the names I start to recognize and the ones that are clearly there every video, which I don't expect people to comment on every video, but you start to really recognize names and um, then you start to... I do my best to remember which team most people go for, the ones that comment regularly. You know, I've started to build a profile and you remember, I don't even know what these people look like. It's kind of a strange 
thing there where people know what I look like and my mannerisms and I'm responding to a username and a profile picture that may or may not be the generic first letter of their name in a certain color. And I know that they're a Essendon fan or a Hawthorne fan or something like that. Um, but I still feel a sense of connection with those people. I really appreciate them in, in a way it's almost like been a surrogate for like friendship here. So I feel like I'm socializing, even though I'm not doing it in the traditional way. Summarize the, my answer to your question, wooden spoon data. It's uh, realizing that being more uh, reliant on it financially has led to me having to work faster on certain jobs. And maybe that compromises on quality, but also means that there's some tasks that I have not been able to do because I don't have time. And secondly, building the relationship with the audience and trying my best to foster and develop that and maintain that has been extremely rewarding. It's probably helped in video performance. It's also made me enjoy this more. He, he's got a good question. He says, what's the favorite video you've ever, ever done? Um, they, they do tend to blur a lot of them. Um, you know, I over the years, I, I did an Adam Simpson documentary that I was really happy with at the time and, and put a lot of effort into, completely demonetized because I used um, copyrighted content because I had to, um, and I was fine with that because it was just a passion project. Uh, but I watch it back now and I, I just cannot watch myself. Like, why am I shouting? You know, that's, that's another thing that's happened over the last year. I actually think I've gotten a lot better speaking on camera in the last 12 months than I did for the entire previous six. And I'm not sure what changed. I, I look back even like middle of 2023, I, I watch myself on video. And I'm like, I don't look confident at all. Maybe it's just repetition, but I've, I have been doing this for a long time. I've already forgotten what the question is. Uh, my, my point there being is like, there's a lot of projects I did early that I was happy with. Um, and then I watch them back now. And I'm like, God, that is rancid. So it's it's hard for me to to enjoy those. Um, I did a video that was very meaningful me, to me like back in 2020. And I talked about, you know, the, the 2018 premiership and, and how that meant so much to me because a year before my mum passed away and it was a very emotional vid and a very revealing vid and a very sincere vid about a, a, something that was very close to me. And the feedback was beautiful. Like everyone was so nice about it. And um, I think it struck a chord, but <laughs> a couple of things as well. Like I watched that back and I'm like, oh, I could, I could have done that better. I hate the way I spoke, spoke on camera. So I've kind of, you know, withdrawn the, that connection to those sort of videos. There was a video I did at the start of the year, um, how the West Coast Eagles became the worst team in the AFL. I changed the title and it's now it's fell from great heights because a lot of Eagles fans Clicked on that thinking that I was ragging on the Eagles um, and commented without watching it in the first three seconds, you see me at an Eagles game. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed making it. And I, I demonetized that video as well to use music. Cause I was like, I, I really just want to make the best video I can about a topic that I am passionate about. And uh, a little bit of it was sloppy. And I think that's something that I have a weakness with, even though I put a lot of time into that, I got a little bit too excited to get it out. And I, I wish I had you know, trimmed the fat a little bit I made a joke halfway through that that didn't seem like a joke because the tone was just wrong. It went from serious to ridiculous Jesse joke to serious again. Um, and that is just how I am. So I think it could have done it better. But I, I, at the same time, I do think that might be my favorite right now, uh, to be honest. But a lot of them a lot of them blur, man. A lot of them blur. I've done like 1,600. I don't even know now. I think I've done 900 since June of last year. That's insane. LSEO says, congrats, mate. Thank you. I follow AFL from Italy. Do you think the AFL will be playing again abroad in the future? Maybe Europe or the US? Um, I, I don't know. It's a tough one. It's been a while since they did that, right? There was a bit of a China experiment. I think it'd be awesome. I think it'd be great to... Um, you know, I don't know how serious the AFL is about growing the game internationally. They've dabbled with it to try and get some viewers and it helped me as a YouTuber. It would help me if we do grow more of an international audience. So I'm all for that. Um, but, you know, the AFL is kind of in its own battle right now trying to become a national competition. Like they're still trying to get games in front of people from New South Wales and Queensland. So I don't know whether the Europe or the US would really be fruitful for them but um i don't know it'd be cool to see like it'd be cool to see an afl game here before i go which is definitely not going to happen but yeah interesting concept it would be great to see them play in italy someday <laughs> dean asks how have you uh, managed moving to a new country and trying to make connections and contacts while making youtube content seems like a pretty isolated way to work yeah i, I touched on this a little bit already but you bang on it is extremely isolating um you know there are days where my roommate because he works nights, um, he, he might sleep during the day and then by the time he wakes up, I've gone to the gym and I come back and he's gone to work for the night. There are literally days where the only people I speak to are like the hot girl at Costa 
Um, and I just say, hi, I'll have a medium cappuccino, please. I'm fantastic with women. Um, but in all seriousness, there are times where those are the only people I speak to for several days. And that sounds really depressing. You know, when I was living in Perth, I did feel a real sense of isolation, but I was in a much more sociable position. I had more friends than I do here, but for some reason I'm good. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think it's the YouTube audience that's been a true surrogate for that. Um, it is, I'm still trying to put my finger on why, why was I so unhappy in Perth feeling isolated? My life was over and I come to England and I may as well not be, you know what I mean? Like I, I mean, that, that's an exaggeration. I, there are, I've experienced England big time, but day to day, like I'm just working from home, um, and not really making meaningful friends or anything like that. But why am I good? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. It's going to make it easier to say goodbye. I think I also came here with the benefit of knowing my roommate so we have a really good friendship and we hang out heaps so i am socializing quite a lot i think if i had a roommate that i never saw there are days where i don't see him but we do hang out heaps i think that that circuit breaker that i have there keeps me sane and i don't know if it would be the same if i didn't have him when i get back to australia i am going to meaningfully work on just building my social life it's not a strength of mine to be honest i am a deeply insular person and that is kind of the, the thing that happens i've heard uh, entrepreneurs talk about this and content creators is that sometimes you just get through your twenties and you get to the end of it and you're just like, Oh man, like I don't have any friends left because I've been buried in this. And that's not just isolated to those types of people. It's mostly people who are career driven, but it is something I think about and I don't want to go back to Perth and be insular and that's going to be tough. But to, to answer your question, I, I, I've been really happy, really present, uh, enjoy my daily routine here and uh, not, not worrying about it too much. We still have our nights out. I still make you know friends for an evening in Macclesfield in the pub and then I go back and probably don't see them again for six months. And it seems to be doing me just fine, to be honest. I guess the rest of my mental well-being is in a good place, so it's fine. Locke says, thoughts on Matty Nix and what the Crows can bring in 2025. Genuine finish on the ladder prediction. And then when will our next premiership window open? Crows are a hard one to read because I thought they were gonna play finals this year. And then they fell away for various reasons, probably a little bit of growing pains, probably optimizing the talent. There was a lot of talk about mid, midfield this year and getting the ball inside 50, balance between inside and out. So um, I'd expect they go close to finals, but there are so many good teams that I think that could come back into finals calculations next year. The Crows are one of them. So they could, they could absolutely make it, but I'm going to say they miss out on finals narrowly. When is their premiership window open? I think... If you did like a, a just a real one-dimensional look at the age trajectory of their list, you'd say three years. If you're looking at just the talent breakdown, I think they're good in a lot of areas, but I would love to see another gun midfielder there to support Jordan Dawson. Um, I think that is probably a necessary punch they need to add to their arsenal. That's not a phrase, but that, that's probably something they need to add to compete deep in finals. Um so I don't know where that's going to come from. There's a draft pick this year. They might end up with Sid Draper, and he could be an A-grade midfielder, but he's also going to be 18. Tough one to really get the read on Adelaide. I'll, I'll do a video um, analyzing them more in depth you know, sometime over the offseason. RPM Certified Moments says, honest question here. Do you think the Magpies will run Nick into the game? He has burnout. I'm a big fan of Nick. Uh, he's by far our best player, but we will get but we will get him some great or equal to talent in the next five years. P.S. Don't come at me thinking I'm hating. I'm just being objective. Uh, yeah, I don't think you're hating. You, you're a Collingwood fan, right? So I don't perceive that as hating. I think that you're just a concerned fan. Um, will they run him into the ground? Well, how are they doing to Nick? Are they placing a burden on him more so than any other 21-year-old who's played just about every game? Is it Collingwood that's doing that? Is it just a byproduct of the fact that he is an unbelievable player and that, that comes with pressure and burden? He strikes me as somebody who can deal with it. He can take it. Um, I think that he might just have this champion Kobe mindset, this Mamba mindset that can deal with it. That doesn't mean he won't burn out at times throughout his career. It is possible, but I don't know if there's much Collingwood should be doing. Like He's already one of their best players. So it's just, you know, to rest him more, maybe they could. I think, you know, there's no doubt that the first couple of years he didn't really play that much of a contested style. Um, so I'm thinking of body wear and tear there. Um, and I think he proved himself this year as a, as a contested mid, but I think he is actually better, you know, one handball away from the stoppage and being that first received midfielder or potentially after that, 
get him in space. Same thing with Harley Reid, to be honest. Um, so I suppose they can protect him in that way and protect his longevity by making sure he's not the first guy getting his hands on the footy, support him with some guys who can feed in the footy, and that might have a long-term effect on his longevity. I mean, look at Paddy Cripps and Lockie, um, sorry, Nat Fife. Lockie was actually the counter example, but Cripps and Fife built a style around being a contested beast. And to different extents, both of their bodies sort of precluded them from being consistent for a lot of their career. I know Cripps is amazing right now, but for a while there, he, he dropped off. After starting well, dropped off, came back. And Fife has been on a decline um, because he just can't get his body right. So there's, there's a counter example and Lockie Neal's never stopped and he's a very contested style midfielder. But perhaps to answer your question, protect him a little bit by making sure he's not always the first one getting the footy and then also be expected to be the guy to deliver it inside 50. Um, and I'm sure they're aware of that. AFL Snap says, congrats on 30K. Thank you. Just wondering if you're interested in NBA or NBL. Sadly not. Um, boring answer. Um, I actually think this is a good question. Why not? Because my dad played basketball for like 20 years and he was always more of a like a Perth Demons West Coast fan and he played basketball. So maybe that's what it is. I think he liked the Wildcats, but for whatever reason, that influence never flowed to me. I never got into basketball. I don't even like watching it. Played a little bit of 2K when I was young. They are good games. But um, yeah, I couldn't care less about basketball. Sorry. Sorry, that's not probably the answer you were looking for. Charlie Findlay says, um, good on you, Jesse. Thank you, mate. Bloody awesome to get 30K people to subscribe to. Think about that. That's a full town like Albany. Also, mate, do you reckon Fremantle will win the premiership in the next three years? Yeah. 30K does seem like a lot. I think at 25, that was probably the only moment I stopped and thought, whoa, that's a lot of people. Um, I think the th being pragmatic about it though, that 30,000 is a reflection of over time, the amount of people that at one point, one singular moment thought that I provided value to them and they rewarded me with hitting subscribe. It doesn't really reflect what my core audience is. What that number is, is hard to know. I saw that in the last three months, 120,000 different unique viewers watched a video on this channel, <laughs> which is like four times my total subscriber count. So 30,000 people that hit subscribe over a long period of time. I really don't think it reflects, you know, me necessarily being that much better than somebody who's on 15K. I really don't. I think it just reflects how long I've been in the game, to be honest. And sometimes, you know, depending on your niche, you'll have more subscribers for half the value that you put out. For Fremantle, I'm not going to bet that they'll win a premiership in the next three years, but they are probably in that window just about, I think. Um, you know, you've only if you can only pick the next three premiers, like you've got to go past Sydney. I mean, Geelong probably still going to be there if they get Bailey Smith. That's actually the next question. Collingwood's still going to be around. Like, it's so hard to limit it to just three teams that I have to pick there. Is Fremantle going to be one of them? No, but I do think they have a premiership quality list by talent. I do think that. Um, but, you know, so did St Kilda back in 09 and 10. So I'm, I'm not too sure, but you're asking, will they win? I'll probably guess no, but they could win one in three years. Um, there's there's certainly a plenty of teams that are less likely to win one in three years. Challenge Edition says, do you think the Cats will contend for the flag you know, in 25 and beyond? <sighs> I think we just have to start saying yes to this every year. Yes, Geelong are a chance. <laughs> they are a chance. I felt like I was one of the more or one of the least to jump off Geelong this year. I thought, you know, nah, they'll, they'll come back. But even I didn't have them in the finals. I think just the outside noise was even more negative than me. But yeah, I was still a million miles off being correct. And even mid-season, I didn't really have that much faith in them. And the end of the year, and of course their first final, was unreal. So I'm just not going to doubt them anymore. And, you know, Selwood left, and they're doing pretty okay. It sucked for a year, but there was also injuries. I don't think they're missing Tom Hawkins. Uh, Tom Stewart's probably got a few years left, I would imagine. Jeremy Cameron, likewise. And they're going to add Bailey Smith. I think Bailey Smith is going to be a star at Geelong. I think he will deliver on the potential. I can't imagine a player going to Geelong and, and not working out. That's the position they are in. Like I, I just fully expect him to be a star now. One more footy question and then a couple of non-footy questions to wrap up. Josh Monaghan says, Why have you been quite, quite low on Bo Allen as a prospect for West Coast to draft? Um, I don't know if I've been... Well, I don't feel particularly low um, on him as such. But I probably have this cognitive bias against just going for the WA kid in like my mock drafts for West Coast. Um, I think it's a little bit too easy. There is some data to suggest we do like local when the talent is even. Um, but, you know, we went like 10 years without taking a West Australian in the first draft and then we took uh, first round of the draft and then we took two in 2022. So 
Um, I probably have just looked more at other prospects to try not to focus on the WA kid. On the other hand, as for him, I think I've made the point that, you know, for West Coast first selection, um, I really want to pick a genuine midfielder. And Bo may or may not be that. And that's pick three. You know, we're probably going to end up with Hawthorne's pick. That's probably more the Bo Allen selection. So if West Coast took a genuine midfielder with their first pick and take Bo Allen, Bo Allen could be a midfielder, but, you know, there's been a lot of history at West Coast of drafting kids with midfield potential that end up in their original position of half back or half forward. So there's probably, I'm probably a little bit gun shy based on that. You know, Jim V was under 18's MVP uh, for WA as a midfielder. And now I think looking at him, he's definitely a defender. So I'll be happy with Bo um, if we take a midfielder with our first selection for sure. Um, perhaps, you know, if we had traded down, let's say we traded three down to pick 10 and something else or whatever, whatever that looks like. And Bo Allen is there at our first selection. That's where I probably go, oh, I kind of want an actual midfielder here. I could be totally wrong and Bo Allen becomes a gun midfielder, but there is a level of doubt there, right? So we'll see. I'd be happy if he ends up at West Coast. The second last question is uh, from user. I can't see his proper name, uh, but it says, why did you move to London? Uh, so yeah, to clarify, I didn't move to London. Um, I think I might've said at the start when I first moved over that I was going to move to London after three months and I decided not to. Part of that was the decision to stay full-time on YouTube and I can't afford to live in London, um, you know, off a YouTube income. Also, I think a lot of people assume that an Australian living in the UK lives in London, but I am one of the few exceptions to that. Honestly, man, it was, it was a culmination of a few things. Um, I think I was, I was desperately unhappy for the last few years living in Perth and that's got nothing to do with the city. I realized that it was my circumstances and I needed to get out. Um, I had... Uh, the benefit of having heaps of friends here. Um, so the mate that I live with here, we've been friends for 15 years, 16 years. Um, and I have a few friends in London, some were Aussies that moved over and others that ended up there from high school because I didn't go to high school in Australia. Like my one of my best mates is Pakistani and he lives in Brixton in London. So I go down there. Uh, my good friend Dylan lives in London. So uh, point being there, I already had an existing friendship network and, and some people that I knew were already doing the same thing. Drew's is another example. He actually moved to England right before I did. So that was part of it. I think I just desperately needed to, to get out. I went to Europe in August of 2022 and started having conversations with my friends who lived here. And, um, you know, I started really thinking about what would it be like if I just quit everything and left my life behind for a while and moved to the UK. Between August to um, like Christmas that year, I thought, I haven't decided if I'm going to go, but I'm waiting for a reason for me to change my mind and stay. And it never came. And uh, as much as I've missed my family and missed out on some good times and my nephew being born, it probably wasn't a strong enough reason for me to not take a leap like this. And I think back to when I was a younger man and I always talked about, yeah, one day I'll go live abroad for a year. And I was 29 when I moved over here and this was literally the last year I could have done it. I think they've changed the rules since and maybe I could have done it a year later, but it was more or less a now or never thing. And uh, it ended up being the best decision I ever made. I am so much happier here. And, you know, it, it is incumbent upon me to have the same attitude when I go back to Australia as when I did when I came over here to build a good life for myself. But I, I think I'll be okay. I think I'll be okay. I think I've grown up a little bit. I think you're always growing up to some extent. My frontal lobe is really forming nicely now. Um, and thought a lot about, you know, the, the situation I was in that I put myself in mentally in the last couple of years there in Perth. So yeah, onwards and upwards, hopefully. Um, but that is more or less why I left. I just needed to get out. And also traveling was a huge primary focus as well. Gus Monfries asks, is this currently your full-time job and do you plan to do this for a career? This is a great question. So the, first of all, the answer is yes, it is my full-time job right now. Do I plan to do this for a career? Um, there are so many sacrifices you have to make to make this work. And I don't know if I can do this again full time once I get back to Perth I really don't think that's the case um, you know on the one hand the financial limitation of it like I make oh, put it this way if you got a job at Bunnings and worked just as a, at the checkout for an entire year you would make significantly more money than I've made in the last year on YouTube so I, I, can, I got away with it for a year I can't do it again um, I need to start building my life so as a financial consideration I also work so much and you know, need to be front and center when, you know, a story breaks, like a trade update or something like that, or an example, or, 
you know, <laughs> weekends off don't exist for AFL. You know, like I can't just take a weekend to disconnect from footy. That is where all the football happens. So it's just very demanding. On the other hand, it's been such a big part of me now for seven years that I can't imagine giving it up. So maybe some sort of hybrid situation where I find other ways to make money or have a part-time job and continue to build this. Um, you know, I've got my Eagles fan channel now that I hope becomes something great. So again, yeah, I can't see myself letting go of this and giving up at this point. It's, um, it's too big a part of me and it's becoming almost something I want to be part of my legacy and tell my kids, like, it'd be cool to have, I have this vision of being like a girl dad, obviously. I'm definitely gonna have girls. And like having them be able to say, oh yeah, my dad's true footy and have it be a cool thing, not a weird thing. It's probably still in the weird category now. Like, oh, my boyfriend's a YouTuber. And, and have that be like a, a cool thing as well. Like that's a cool vision that I have that I would just like to hold on to for a little bit longer. So that is formally the last question. Um, but I, ha I have one that I wanna throw in here that I think is a good question. And um, it actually came from my good friend, Dylan. When I went down to London a few weeks ago, we are having some park beers, which is something you could do here. You can just go to a park at 1 a.m. and sink beers on a Sunday night, and it is completely legal. I don't recommend it, but it was a one-off thing we did, and we had a great time. And the, the question moved towards, like, why, why do I love West Coast so much? Why do I love football so much? And he um, respectfully, completely respectfully, we have a very honest conversation. He, he wondered, like, do you think you and others get so into football so that they can sort of enjoy some sort of triumph or victory that they didn't really earn. <laughs> like that's a really cynical way of phrasing it. I can't remember how he phrased it, but you know what I mean? Just enjoy the glory of something without even having to really work for it. You know, I contemplated that for a moment and I thought, no, because I'm just as into this when West Coast are terrible. Um, you know, West Coast have had a lot of good times and, um, as an organization, when we fall, we really know how to fall. So I've been through it all and I'm just as invested when we're rubbish as to when we're successful. Perhaps that's true of some people who, you know, say they go for, um, you know, Man United <laughs> in the Premier League, but only watch when they're winning or any Man City fan. Like, why do you even exist at this point? But anyway, I think it's a good question. I'm trying to think what the answer is for me. Like when I first got into, uh, I've been an Eagle supporter for a long time, like my whole life that I can remember since about eight. And I was a passionate fan when we won 06. I remember thinking that was the best day of my life. But then it just took on a whole different meaning when I became like an adolescent. And I've, I've said this before, but I think I was going through some girl trouble in about 09. So I was like 15 and, um, you know, classic high school heartbreak kind of situation. And I just remember putting all of my emotion and energy into supporting West Coast and investing in the build. And, um, you know, it bits, from that point, it became part of my identity. I reckon late 2009 is where I went insanely West Coast Eagles fan. I think there is something about that, that I wanted to throw my emotion and, and love into something that couldn't reject me. I know I've said that before, and I know that sounds really depressing, but I do wonder if that's a psychological element here for some people with their football teams. It's an unconditional love. I think that was motivating for me at the time. You know, it was a distraction, escapism, and that's another big part of what it is, escapism from your life. And, um, you know, it's wrong to say football can't break your heart. That is absolutely wrong, but perhaps just not in the same way. There's a tribal element to it. It's community, um, and I like that as well. But equally, my love for West Coast is also so deeply personal that I could enjoy it without socializing. Um, it's nice to share these things with other Eagles fans. Um, and I've really enjoyed the Eagles channel for that reason, but because it's, it is also such a deeply personal thing, it's like a religion, I can enjoy it even if I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. So I think, what, what do, why do I invest so much into this team? And I think, other than it being my career, which I reflected on, I don't know where my love for West Coast would be if True Footy had never been a thing. Would after 2018, would I have found closure? We've got the premiership that I so badly craved. Would I have moved on? Would I have become more career focused in something else? Either way, I'm still here. And I still love them as much as I ever did. And I think the answer of, of why, uh, you know, I'm so invested in football, generally speaking, not just West Coast, but football, is it's moments. I think it's the beauty of moments that keep me coming back for more, like this sick little drug that I'm addicted to. Because I think of like all the greatest feelings I've had as a West Coast fan are specific moments. Um, I remember being in Abu Dhabi where I lived at the time watching a game back on replay that I knew the result of um, but my dad didn't and we were watching the end of West Coast GWS where with one second to go Nick Natnui grabs out of the ruck snaps a goal 
and the roar, like the roar that me and dad did, even though I knew the results, I didn't know how we won. We screamed the house down and everyone in the house was like, what the hell's going on here? I remember being in 2017, I remember being at my girlfriend's house and her dad was a passionate West Coast fan and Shuey gets awarded the free kick after the siren to sink Port Adelaide and I just remember Tony turning off the lights and we all ran to different corners of the room and it was a really weird thing to do, but those little things stay with me. Even the glory of the moment of Luke Shuey kicking the first goal of the 2015 grand final, more or less right in front of me, that was just such a beautiful moment. It's, it's literally these things that I'm craving for and they are few and far between. The last one I think that I had that was really transcendent was when Kennedy kicked the goal late to beat Richmond in 2021. It's been a tough slog as an Eagles fan since, but I think it's just the belief that that moment will come back and then it's over. It's just, it's ridiculous. I think I like the beauty of moments like that. And, you know, I remember after we won the premiership in 2018, being at the game, I remember I had dad to my right and to my left, I had this, uh, older gentleman, he's probably like 45, I just mean older than me. He was an Eagles fan and, um, you know, we didn't talk the entire game. And after the siren went, I was just like crying <laughs> because I'm a little bitch. I was just so overjoyed, obviously. And I just remember being so full of emotion and adrenaline that I just put my arm around this bloke and he was there by himself. And I remember he kind of looked around at me and I just sort of looked back at him and then I just put my arm down. And honestly, up until recently, that has remained one of the cringe moments of my life <laughs> that I have never spoken about before. Um, but then I realized, looking back at it, I was like, that bloke was there by himself. Why was he there by himself? Um, could it be that his wife and kids just couldn't get a ticket? I don't know. Um, but there was some, something beautiful about that at the same time. It was just like something that connected all of us together. This incredible moment. And I, I think that's what keeps me coming back for more. Like I think about, I fantasize about the next moment, you know, we kick a goal to get back into finals and how emotional that's going to feel. And I cannot wait to experience that. It's all part of the journey. You just have to deal with a lot of shit in between, don't you? Anyway, that's why I love this game. And that wasn't even a question that you guys asked. That was from my friend Dylan. And I think that is my answer. Um, I, I think, you know, I can even enjoy it in other teams. Like I think, I love the 2016 Bulldogs Premiership because you can see the emotion on the siren. All these Bulldogs fans that have never seen their team play in a grand final, let alone win one, how much it meant to generations of Bulldogs fans. The same thing with Richmond. I love the footage of Richo crying like a little girl. I love that because that was me in 2018. And, you know, that goes back further. Richmond back through the 80s. There was a sick little part of me. When Fremantle beat us in the Derby in 2021, I think that broke like an 11-win streak that West Coast had. And obviously, this was like the decline of West Coast starting. And I was watching it, and I remember thinking, I remember the siren going and Optus Oval erupting and purple going everywhere. And there was a part of me that thought, fuck, that's cool. That was cool for them to overcome their big brother and, and finally beat them, get one over them in the Derby. I thought for two seconds, I was like, that is a cool moment. And then I went back to being shit. And that has pretty much been the tone of being a West Coast fan ever since. But this has been a very long podcast, guys. So I thank you so much for all your support. I thank you for your questions. Um, normal routine will continue. After this, I'm going to do probably my Brownlow predictions. But a huge sincere thank you to you all. This little chapter of my life of living in England has been the biggest period for true footy as well. These things are interlinked. And I know... When I get back to Australia, I'm going to reflect on this time that I've had here in England, and I'm going to think of it as the good old days. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoy your support, and I really endeavor to try and keep delivering on this as best as possible once I figure out what the hell I'm doing with my life. But it has been a wonderful chapter, arguably the best chapter of my life. So thank you so much. I'm actually getting a little emotional. Um, I'll see you in the next one, guys. Cheers.